When one particular item impacts another, it can leave a mark. And the same is the case for God in our lives. However, it's a positive mark. 
If we have experienced the Lord, then He should have some impact upon our lives. And if the Lord has impacted our lives, He's going to leave a mark. In fact, John Wesley spoke about the marks of the new birth. We, we hear the scriptures read about Jesus telling Nicodemus, hey, you've got to be born again. And, and we grasp the concept, but what does that actually look like? What, what does it mean to be born again? If we say that we have experienced God as Lord and Savior in our lives, there should be a noticeable difference in us. We ourselves and others around us should be able to see that something is uniquely divine in each and every one of us if we have been impacted by God. John Wesley held that there were three distinctive marks, three distinctive characteristics that each person who proclaims to be a Christ follower should have active within them. And the first one is faith. We talked about faith last week, saving faith. Namely that this saving faith is, is not the faith of the heathen. You remember that the heathen believes, oh, there is a God, and yes, we should seek Him, and God rewards those who do His will, and that the faith of the heathen also believes, hey, you know what, we should be good, moral, virtuous people, and we should act according to the truth. That's the faith of the heathen, and that doesn't cut it for saving salvation. Then there's the faith of the devil. Well, the devil believes Jesus is real. The devil knows who Jesus is. But the devil is not saved. Why? Because he does not place his trust in, in Jesus. And even the faith of the apostles while Jesus was on earth. Why was their faith inadequate even though they left their homes and they left everything behind? It's because they did not yet realize the necessity of the death and resurrection of Jesus. John Wesley held that the notion of faith, real biblical faith, is not just some intellectual assertion that, oh yes, I believe the gospel is true. It's not just understanding the Bible or theology. It's not a dead faith as he called it, it is a disposition of the heart. Wesley put it this way, faith is a disposition of the heart which God has walked in his heart, his being the believer's heart. A sure trust and confidence in God that through the merits of Christ, his sins are forgiven, forgiven and that he is reconciled to the favor of God. We, we are people who have been saved from the consequences of our sin. And we've been saved by the blood of Christ. We're not saved because we're good people. We can't be good enough for that. We're not saved because we care about each other and we smile at each other a lot. We are saved through faith by the blood of Christ. Wesley said that when it comes to faith, there are two specific uh, fruits that come from that. If we have true faith in God, we have been given also power over sin. That's the first one. In other words, you don't have to go on living in it. And in fact, we are commanded not to. Romans chapter 6, Paul says, well, Shall we sin then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his, his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism. And he goes on. He said, for if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died 
has been set free from sin. Simply put, sin should no longer control us. Especially that which we know God has said, hey, don't do this. <clears throat> we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us to resist. Too often the problem is we don't want to resist. So the first fruit of faith is power over sin. The second fruit of faith is peace. Again, John Wesley said that this is the peace that, quote, all the power of earth and hell are unable to shake, take from it. Waves and storms beat upon it, but they shake it not, for it is founded upon the rock. You've heard me quote Philippians chapter 4 as a benediction many times. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let me ask, what, how would you rate the level of peace in the soul that you have today? Where's your peace level? If we have faith in Christ, then we have the peace of Christ. Yeah, I mentioned earlier that this time of year where we start washing cars, you know, the other thing that happens this time of year is that thing called March Madness. You're probably more likely to hear me sing the tune, It's the most wonderful time of the year. You're, you're more likely to hear me sing that now than at, at Christmas time. I believe what makes the NCAA basketball tournament so great is because it's those smaller mid-major schools that get a chance to go up against the big schools. I still remember a few years back when Middle Tennessee State University, we got any alumni here, soon to be student here, uh, you, yeah, they took down the powerhouse Michigan State. That was a 15 seed taking down a 2 seed, and I loved it. What makes it so fun and what drives the players, the coaches, the fans of these underdog teams as a little word called hope. It's hope. Hope is everything in sports. And in fact, hope is really everything in life, too. Especially for Christians. And hope is the second mark of those who have been born again. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's a living hope, not a dead hope. You say, well, what's a dead hope? Well, that's kind of like wishful thinking. A dead hope would be like, you know, it would be the same as me daydreaming about how I'm going to spend the millions of dollars I won uh, on I won playing the lottery even though I never buy a lotto ticket. Okay. You can understand that's never going to happen. I'm not advising you to buy lottery tickets, by the way. It's hard to win the lottery you never play. Just saying. And if, you, if we're just thinking about, oh yes, yeah, so here's what I would do with this, it's, it's a dead hope. But we have a living hope. This is real. It's really going to happen. And hope is central to the Christian life. It's, it, our hope is not in this age. We believe God moves mightily in, in, in this time and among His people. But our hope ultimately is in the age to come. It is that Christ will return. The dead in Christ will be resurrected to new life. We will be given immortal bodies. God will restore the world and He will make it new again. And He will set the wrongs to rights. 
He will indeed correct the injustices of the world. And we will be with him. Revelation chapter 21 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death. No more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And he said, write, these down, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. This is our Christian hope. It gets better when the kingdom comes. The very best of this age does it even compare to the worst day that's coming in the new age God does not abandon his creation we have the hope that God yes is actively moving among us now but our hope is that he is going to remake the world hope it is central. Do we have hope in the Lord? So the marks of the new birth is faith, it is hope, and then there is one more. I love the story from Moody's Anecdotes. It says, starts out, it says, show me a church where there is love and I'll show you a church that has a power in the community. It says in Chicago a few years ago, this would actually be many years ago now, a, a little boy attended the Sunday school I know of, D.L. Moody speaking. He says when his parents moved to another part of the city, the little boy, the little fellow still attended the same Sunday school, although it meant a long, tiresome walk each way. A friend asked him why he went so far and told him that there were plenty of other places just as good near him. And the boy responded, they may be as good as others, but not for me. Why not? And the boy, asked, the boy answered, because they love a fellow over there. If only we could make the world believe that we love them, there would be fewer empty churches and a smaller portion of the population that has never darkened a church door. Let love replace duty in our church relationships and the world will soon be evangelized. Love. It is the third mark of those who have been born again. Wesley believed that the love of God should be shed abroad within the heart of the believer. And when we have the love of God within us, things happen. Just as there are fruits of faith in our lives, there are fruits of God's love in our lives. One is that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Yes, this is the second of the greatest commandments. And it's second only to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, as Jesus said. The reality is that we cannot love God and at the same time hate our brother and sister in Christ. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister for whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. <coughs> Hate cannot rule in our lives. We also remember the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, he tells the parable to, to a religious leader who's, who said, well, who is my neighbor? And what, you know, Jesus tells this parable that, hey, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Robbers beat him, took everything he had, left him for dead. 
priest came by, did nothing. A Levite came by, did nothing. Finally, a Samaritan, you know, the, the people that the Jewish people absolutely hate. Samaritan comes by, takes pity on the man, a Jewish man, binds up his wounds, puts him on his, his animal and takes him to the nearest inn, cares for him, tells the innkeeper, hey, here's some money, take care of him. If there's anything owed, when I get back, I'll pay it then. And Jesus says, which one acted neighborly? Obviously the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan. And he says, go and do likewise. Do we care for the poor? Do we help the homeless? Do we visit the sick? Are we there for the ones who are suffering? Do we love people when their world is a mess? It's easy to love and be around people who's got, whose life is all together. Or at least can give the appearance of it. <coughs> but when people's lives are a mess, it's harder to love people there. When, when they can't make sense of what's up and what's down, it takes a lot more. So the first fruit of love, the love of God being within us, is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. The second fruit of having God's love within us is what John Wesley phrased, the universal obedience to God. Peter T. Forsyth said, the first duty of every soul is not to find its freedom, but its master. We are saved, we are, we are not saved that we can have freedom to do whatever we want, but we are saved that we may do the will of Christ and be in right relationship with Him. We are bought with a price, the scriptures teach, the precious blood of the Lamb. And the imagery there, when it says bought with a price, the imagery is that we are a slave. We've been a slave to sin, and Jesus buys us by his own death and sacrifice. And, and just because you've been bought as a slave doesn't mean you're free. No, it means you have a new master. Jesus has bought us, paid dearly for us. We, we are, as Paul says, slaves to Christ now. We are to do his bidding. We are to seek to live in obedience to him. So faith, hope, and love. These are the marks of a Christian. We may have lock chips, marks on our cars. We may have marks of places. I remember when I was a kid and I uh, rode my bike and inevitably I crashed. And I remember one time I was literally picking gravel out of my knee, yeah, it leaves a mark, there's a scar there. The question really is, can the world see the marks that God has made in you? Can the world see the marks of faith, hope, and love? May it be so among the people called Methodists at Lewisburg First United Methodist Church. May the world see the marks in you. Let's pray. Jesus, we are thankful, Lord, for the grace that you give us. Father, when it comes to faith, hope, and love, our prayer is that these marks would be evident and easily seen by the world beyond these walls. Help us to have saving faith, to embrace that, to have that sure and confidence, a trust and confidence that you have indeed saved us, not by our works, but by yours, Lord. To continually have hope in the kingdom that is coming. And to have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts.
that we love our neighbor as ourselves, and that we serve you in total obedience. May it be so, Lord, among us. In Jesus' name, amen.